terms of technical efficiency, some of the movement, then it's actually the magnos which have better resolution for bus routes. And then from there, as we said, they go into V1, and we have separate ocular dominance columns, and therefore they come in separate. So the different layers of LGN go into different ocular dominance columns, and the parvo, the magno and the parvo, end up in different layers of area four, of layer four. So here's an x-ray. If I would cut out a piece of cortex and I show it to a cell, and I ask it, where does it come from? Is it an auditory cortex, a visual cortex, a motor cortex? What do you know? No, this is just layer four. This is just layer four. Above it is layers one, two, and three, and below it is five and six. Is there a very clear segregation between the parvo cell level and the magnus cell level? Yes. The cells are very different, they, and they input to different structures. So is there a clear segregation of them? Or? Yes. Okay. There's totally different layers here. These are not. which we 
respond to color and probably not to orientation. And they stain differently with a cytokine oxidative thin, and therefore you can see them. And presumably there are blobs for red, green, and blobs for blue, yellow, according to Harry. from layer 4B going to MC, to area B5, actually, and from uh, 2 and 3 going out, of course, not that way. They all go out below, going to B4 and into a temporal cortex, or to B5 and so this would be 2 and We have different pathways going uh, to the dorsal and the ventral parts of the head. If anything from the eye, it goes to the lip and then right in the middle of the head, to B1 in the back, and then forward going forward up and forward down. This is it. Now just to what happens in B2? In B2, yes, go ahead. So that's just the point. They create pathways which go in different places. So, for example, in B2, the information that comes from the color blob goes to what they call the thin stripes. So the information that comes from around that goes to the interstripes. And the information that comes from 4B goes to the thick stripes. These stripes are again defined by staining by the cytokine oxidase. Uh, when we get to B1, we all, all the time related stuff. So how does the thing move to the body? I don't understand the question. between the dorsal and the ventral areas. Okay. These are the areas in monkey's cortex. Just to show that things are not that simple anyway. Uh, and why is B1 cut off from B2 and then from B3 and so on? Why is it cut here? Thank you. 
some of the connections between scenarios. <laughs> so to say that it's very simply organized, which is really easy. Okay. Back to you. Okay, let's just give recognition which is where it's due. Mort Mishkin and Leslie Ungeleider and then I H are the ones who first proposed the separation of credential and the dorsal screen. Okay? And said that the difference between them is that we know where something is to the dorsal stream and the ventral stream tells us what it is. Okay, we have a separation between what and where. Just forget the dorsal and ventral. Ventral means mantra stomach, so the mantra is in the stomach, and the dorsal is in the back the dorsal. Okay. And as you may recall, when we talked about
those techniques are the techniques knowing that we know where different cells grow up, that it's showed in a very specific way. I don't want to get into it, but I do want to say that the separation between where and what might uh, prevail. Okay? Uh, this is Becky, who was probably the one who did the most studies on the different areas and finding each one what its main thing is calling B5 the motion area, B4 the color area, and so on. And I'll have to stop to you further. Um, and I don't know if you want to put But in there is found an artist in B4 was bilaterally uh, affected by the stroke, and therefore he was cortically blind. Okay? And therefore could not see color and could not draw color, try to draw the pain. you, and I just want to show you this, which is Livingston and Hugel, the same Hugel, now with a different gal, with, uh, and showing that three different separation into three types of areas, color, form, and motion, and the way they connect, so this is what we talk about. Okay, good. Along comes Mel Goodale and David Miller, and they say, uh, sorry, it is not the two pathways, yes, they exist, and indeed one is to tell us something about shape, but the other one we should not call it the area for knowing where something is without motion, but rather how to respond to something in the brain. And they found a patient who had the areas like one, two, three, destroyed, therefore was exceptionally blind. Unable to see anything, walked around with a cane. And then they said to her, okay, here's a flashlight, point to the flashlight. She didn't even point to the flashlight, it's fine. It looks fine, but she pointed to the flashlight. And then they gave her a letter and they said, um, you see this clot over here, this clot, Yeah. 
know exactly how exact they are. And therefore, they can know if this look, 10% bigger, will the face is 10% bigger. Well, John, John checked the, you know how to call it, the diameter of the tube, either two or some sort of cup. No, no, she said it was, that's exactly what I said. She said it was some sort of cup. When you want to pick up a cup, you know the orientation of your hand and finger. And that's, and that's what I was trying to show you. You set your fingers before. You don't go there, then turn in the right direction, then get there and do nothing. <laughs> okay. You can fill it out. How many patients are there now? So I just said there's 30 in the room. No, there's one patient. One patient? One patient. Finally, we ultimately we can do it in vitro by fMRI. Once you see fMRI images, so fMRI. You've all heard about it. Born in '78, we're measuring magnetic resonance images measured for magnetic quality of tissue. fMRI, functional MRI, measures the magnetic quality of blood flow.
at something more clever. Ritalati was feeding his monkey friend uh, Dino and uh, measuring the motor cortex. And lo and behold, some of the neurons in motor cortex started responding when he was feeding them. And further studies found the problem. In motor cortex, you have a response to visual had an action or which dictate an action. And it's the same part of the cortex where the same neurons would be planning, predicting, uh, causing the same animal to do its response in the same way. So mirror neurons are somehow relating perception and action. And not only action, but action of someone else and at the same time my own. So if I see someone pick up a pen, it can be them picking up or my picking up, and I see it, then there's part of the brain which is going to plan my motor control to pick up the pen, it's going to be activated. Motor neurons, mirror neurons. Neurons which reflect what I'm seeing <coughs> and what I would do, which neurons I would use if I wanted to do it. So there are a few points here We represent vision in terms of the action seen. I see an action, and that is re not only do I see the separation, therefore, between vision and action, perceptual cortex, visual cortex, and motor cortex is not an absolute separation. But rather, I'm seeing in terms of the action. Number two, we represent vision in terms of potential response to the action. So it's either mimicry, seeing the same action again, or my own response to the action. When I see my grandmother, I not only see her, I also plan going close to her and giving her a hug. It's part of the perception. It's not after I perceive then I plan. We can learn how to respond by watching others respond. If I see this is a pen, and I see that people take it and draw with it, then I can learn that the way to draw is to take the pen and draw it, because I watch somebody else do the same thing. And there is claim that, A, we learn speech in this way by watching the mouths of others. I don't know if you've ever fed kids, but when I feed my grandchildren, they just feed themselves. So mimicry, it's a way of learning to respond to what I can see. And one of the claims is that autism spectrum is caused by some problem in the neurons. So I think it's still not still in good question now, uh, but it was at least an original claim. How thorough is the functional selection of the neurons? So if, if that's the case, Thank you. 
see how it affects you. Yeah? What's the problem with that? Maybe the function is more general. Maybe it's like this plus other things. Yeah? Other things? Skipping to this other thing, and what does she do? Let's talk a moment about motion perception. Bill Newsom, I know this, said, let's take a lot of dust and move them in one direction. Okay? And we ask them which direction they're moving, we know they're moving this. Now we take half of them randomly moving and half of them moving to the right. Are they moving? No problem. Move it to the right. What happens when you get down to two or three percent? <coughs> That's a bad depression. You can tell which direction it's moving at about two or three percent. So they trained monkeys to look at uh, a bunch of these dots moving in this direction. Okay, some random, some moving. Then they turn it off, and the monkey is supposed to look in the direction of where it was moving. Okay? So if half the dots were moving up and half were moving down, or they were all moving randomly, and you turn off the motion, which way is it going to look? 50-50. And maybe another preference in one of the two directions. Okay? And it's chance of seeing it moving to the right. So there's a big chance and a small chance depending on whether a lot of them were moving to the right or a lot of them were more were moving to the left. Okay? And the dotted line, the dotted line is what they found and it's near the middle is a little bit of a preference to the left. Okay? Then they simulated and they changed the Another example, this is probably a different monkey or a different place. He had a preference in the other direction, and they affected him in the other direction. Okay. This sort of proves that these neurons are influential in making the decision of the mind. We don't know if it's the whole story, we don't know which part of the story, but we know it's part of the story is happening at this level. And the reason they were able to do this is because not just one neuron is having an effect, but rather there are columns there also involved with the organization of the neuron according to the direction of, of motion that it's perceived. Okay. Yeah, but they don't simulate one neuron, they simulate a population of neurons, and therefore they can be correlated, which are all directions related to the same direction. So they're effectively the same. So they're not saying that one neuron is, but the area of neurons Activity, they influence behavior in, in doing the perception. Is there any other case that this was done? Yeah, yeah. in what? It's been done in uh, some other sensory cortex, the Romo. It's been done also in uh, facial activity. By, uh, that you can influence by facial activity. Hmm? You can influence. 
So first let's start with depth. How do we see depth? Okay. And we need about uh, 10 different cues for depth, and therefore each function is one. Parallel lines <coughs> get closer. Parallel lines get closer as they get farther away. Farther away. Good. Thank you. Next.
when the roads are you know, have a certain spatial frequency, and the kids that are far away are not letting us have a more of a section. Yeah. Shadows. So what are shadows? You can have a group of cats and different shadows in different directions, and then it means that relative to the light, they're on different frequencies. Very good. So we can tell from shadows something about Because lenses are not perfect. And uh, the image coming this way and this way is not perfect there. And if you close it down, then you get a perfect uh, picture. Okay? A pinhole camera is always in focus. Good, OK. Did we motion and mention everything already? Depth by the size if we know the size, and if we can know the size. 
dies by death if you know the debt. Okay? So they're two trade off against each other. So if we know that we're looking at people, then we can assume that their sizes are the same, and therefore we can know their debt. We're looking at trees. So we can death by linear perspective. I have some pictures of linear perspective I can bring you. I can look, oh, he has linear perspective. This guy is much bigger, even though we know the size of people. Okay? And he looks much bigger than this guy because we assume that these traps are going out of this group of vistas. Okay? And relative to the tracks, he's bigger. But of course, what we ought to assume is that their tracks are getting narrower. Because we know people are another one that nobody mentioned, which is aerial perspective. Things in the distance go through the air. We see them through a lot of air, and therefore they get grayer and grayer. Okay? Things that are close have more color. You know, the color is here and not there. They get gray and grayer as we go through the air. When you have a knife come thin, you can see this very well. You look into the distance and you can see that color Brunelleschi did the following trick. He, he really is the first one who understood linear perspective. So he took a piece of paper, cardboard, and he made a hole in it, and he had people looking at this beautiful um, building, which is the, um, what is it called, the baptistry uh, in, in Milano. And it's, it's got this octagonal shape, so it's complicated, but he knew how to draw it. So he drew a picture perspective tell us? Perspective tells you, as you did mention, that things which are further away uh, look smaller. Lines which are parallel meet. Here's another example of the stoa. And you can see that all the lines which are along the same height in a different position all meet more or less at the same point. And that means that things that are on the ceiling come down as they get further away, and they, things on the floor go up as they go further away. They meet at the horizon. And the two walls seem to come together. Okay, so the walls come together, the floor goes up. Okay? So we can tell distance by how high the thing is in the picture. Okay. Here's an example of a very poor linear perspective, okay, because it tends to have it that this line is not You know, what can you do? This is uh, 14th century, so they didn't understand. And then it depends where your eye position is when you look at a scene. Okay, whether the lines meet this way or that way. Where the horizon is. Here's a Dura. Okay, where they all meet at this point. Where they meet Try and fool you about the perspective, like in this guy. I mean, these guys, the poor guys, they have to climb up all the time and walking up. The other guys, lucky, they were just walking down all the time. <laughs> it's Eshin. Okay. And the next one is linear perspective. Let's just get this in the crowd. Sorry. Curiopsis is the following. Everything along this plane is what we call in parity, meaning if we are looking at this point, the 
this point falls on the phobia of both sides. Why did this fall on the phobia of both sides? Because that's exactly what we did. We moved the eye so that the point we're looking at falls on the phobia. Now what about this point? This point is also on that curve. It falls on a different plane, not on the phobia. How far from the phobia? Let's call it two centimeters. How far from this phobia? Also two centimeters. That's parity. Equality between the two. They both fall the dead same distance from the phobia. Okay? Clear? Now let's go to a different point. Let's go to this yellow point. This one goes to the right of the phobia on this side and to the left of the phobia on this side. That's not parity. That's called disparity. Disparity. And the one that's closer also is disparity. And what about this point? This red point. This red point here. Well, it's at the same place as this green point in this eye, but it's in a different position in this eye. Here it's together with the green and here it's different. Disparity. We have to use that disparity for judging the distance of an object. You don't like it. Go ahead. No, I'm just trying to say like the eyes are like the initial view of the scope. Yeah. So what what's the what do you think is the closest? You're looking Neurons which are receiving information from here and 
from there. They just died. Otherwise, we wouldn't know. So we have to have neurons which are tuned to different disparities. And the map in V1 is only a gamma map. Some of those neurons are seeing things which are different in the different halves. Okay? So don't believe Google and Riga. The maps are not exact. They can't be because they have to see disparities. Now, one of the things about vision, the whole subject that we're not dealing with at all is the development of the visual system. We are not born with perfect vision. And one of the things that we have to do during early development is to align the maps to which we are. Okay? We're not perfect in the V1, and we have to align and set up also this disparity stuff. So we have a lot of possibilities at birth, and we've proven a way to find that don't fit the correct world. some neurons which see everything that's far and not things which are close, and others which are close and not far, um, and others which are vice versa, and then we have some neurons which are tuned, excitatory for only specific distances. So we do know that there are neurons that do exactly this stuff. Have you ever seen them? V1. V1. Yeah. It's the first place where this combined is seen throughout. Not LGN? No. no. LGN does not have The next one I want to talk about is motion. Now, what is motion? How can we see motion in waves? Okay, so first of all, what's the simplest definition of motion? And no, it's not true. Okay. Um, okay. So motion, by definition, is a change in position of the time. Motion detection does depend on detecting a change in position of the time. But most of us perceive steps into a change in position. Okay? And I'm supposed to be able to show you this if I can show you an effect, which I should try and do. Um, I can do it simply like this somewhere. Let's see if I can do this. First of all, here, this picture. Can you see? No, you don't. Um, so I have to go with my other hand. Okay. One second more. Is this good enough? No. Um, some things work and some things don't work. But, uh, See her moving? You saw her? Yeah. yeah. The point was that she moves, but she doesn't change position. You got that? She 
looks like she's moving, but she's not changing position. You're changing the shadows on her, but she's not moving. Yet you see her move. She's moving, but not changing position. So this one I can't get. So let's try this one down here. Uh, yeah. Okay, here. Watch the waterfall. This is the original, and you have to look right in the middle of the waterfall. Okay, keep looking at the waterfall. You're supposed to see motion, right? Now it's supposed to go up, up instead of down. You didn't get it. We'll try this one. Okay. Look at the blue point right here. Okay. Stare at the blue point. Okay. Just stare at the blue point. Oh, the light doesn't make any difference. Okay. Stare at the blue point. You're staring at the blue point. Now what happens? You see motion going upward. But you see motion without seeing a change of position. So, motion is by definition a change of position in the sun, but yet you're able to have a percept, a feeling that you're seeing motion without seeing a change of position. Okay? So maybe the, um, okay. Okay. So, how do we do it? This is the right by detector, and there are uh, two possibilities. In order to see something that's here now and there later, we have to have receptors in two different positions. We want to see here now, there later, and with a combine the two together, we want to have a delay. I'm sorry. We have here now and there later. So here now, there later, it's moving in this direction, and therefore, first it signals this, and then it waits a little while. Now it signals this, they arrive together, and they come together. Okay? So here we have the summation of two things which happens first here and then here. Wi-Fi detector certainly is true in science. Probably true with people. Now, here's the same thing, but with a inhibition. So we're gonna have it here now and then here. So if it moves in this direction, it'll wait, we'll see it here, it'll wait, then we'll see it here, and this will inhibit it. So the difference between the two is that this has a coincidence detector. It sees when the two happen and got here together. This sees only if they don't get here together. So in this direction, you'll have a good response, but in this direction, not a good response. This one will have a good response in this direction and not a response in the other one. Okay? Both exist and both exist within our visual system. Okay? We're on the right side. Werner Reichardt uh, uh, worked in uh, Germany. He was uh, in his high school and he started working on uh, physics and on these kind of problems. And then he was uh, drafted into the German army and they had him doing some work there. And then he found a way of sending signals to the Allied armies against the German civilian commanders. There are lots of the scientists that we've talked about what they did during the war. Okay. Um, the caption here is wrong, but let's just say that we have neurons that we can record from, which in one direction of motion will respond, in the opposite direction of motion it will not. So there's been a lot of study of these motion of things. Okay. And we talked about this one. Uh, sorry, you have to read all this. This is from the uh, abstract of commonly assumed that the brain constructs its percept of visual scene from information encoded in a selective response to the first neuron. But how do we know that it really does? And therefore he does this study where he stimulates and 
Additional dose indicators for physiological properties measured at the hormonal level can be causally related to a specific aspect of her, her sexual performance. Okay? Okay. Another way of looking at this wine factor spectrum is that we drew a map now, not of position and position, but space and time. So we have this position and this position, and we have early and late. So something which is first here and then here will have, if we have a summation right back then, it'll be motion. Okay? Now we can generalize it and say anything which is in this orientation in space time okay, would give a good response. Something that's moving in this direction, in other words, I'm sorry, this direction, which is moving not this way in space, but this way in space, will go this way and will have inhibition before the excitation, but certainly not a summation going this way. Okay, this here is the proper case because it's time against space. And time goes in this direction. So it moves spatially. And that means that something which is moving that way or jumping from position to position will be seen as the same thing. This is called apparent motion. When we have something which is here and then here, and we see it as motion, it's called apparent motion. If we see it moving gradually, then it's real motion. Okay? Where have you seen apparent motion? Flip flop. Flip flop? Yeah. Flip flop. Flip flop. Yeah. Yeah. Where else? Every computer screen and movie screen and so on are, but they're fast enough that it's really difficult to call it apparent motion. But let's say on Times Square you see the lights going around, they don't move around, they flash on and off. Okay? And when you have the sun, you think an arrow is just going from one here to one here. And it, it looks like it's moving. Okay? Good. So that's apparent motion. So is all motion apparent motion? In some sense, yes, because our eyes keep moving in this little habit every saccade of stopping and starting the next some sense each all motion that we see is apparent motion. Okay. Now there's an, a correspondence problem. Let, let me just show you a little bit of, of apparent motion. This is apparent motion. Now you imagine that you all see this dot flashing back and forth. And you see it as motion moving back and forth, even though it's just two still pictures. Okay? Now what happens if one of them, sorry, one of them is a triangle? Do you still see motion? Yes. And what happens with the dots and the triangle? The general claim is that what one sees is that this circle changes its shape along the way. And somewhere in the middle, it's sort of half circle and half triangle. So we're filling in what we expect. Okay. Now what happens if we have two dots and one dot? They converge. And, and yeah, we can can do it this way too. They can converge and change shape at the same time. Okay, good. But now we have another question. What happens if we have two dots and then we replace them with another two? What are the two possibilities? Yes, in this case though, because we only have two rather than four, we will see them either as moving horizontally or vertically. Okay, sorry. So which way do you see them, vertical or horizontal? So some see it that way and some see it that way. If you see it too much in one direction, cover one pair and then you'll see the other direction. You know, put up your hands and cover it. Okay? Now, okay, this is called the correspondence problem. Okay, so you can see it in either direction. One is a triangle. So there is a preference for seeing. You can still see it both ways, but there's a preference for maintaining it more often than not. And what about colors? Here is vertical. Correspondence. 
You can also do other games with it, like uh, sorry. What is moving here? The square, right? What square? Is there a square somewhere? There is no square. There's an imaginary, illusionary square, and the illusionary square is moving. Yes. also moving either up, down, or right, left. And you can change it if you want by putting your finger there, you can change it. Are they all moving in the same direction? Or are some of them moving up, down, and some of them moving right, left? They're all up, down. Can some of you see if some of them are all moving right, left? Anyway, if they're all moving together, different context was, if we see, you know, one of these moving, and we perceive it moving up-down, let's say, we don't perceive right-left. 
does the visual system see both of them and therefore adapt also to right and left even though we never consciously perceive it? And the answer is yes. In other words, the visual system is working at both motions and then deciding upon one of them and that's what we perceive. But both motions are down there and therefore it adapts and it prevents those adaptations between the same plane and later. But at what point in the visual sense both motions stop being together and just one of them continues to move? I don't know where exactly. Somewhere let's say in M2. But before, not and after. Okay. Is this in the top down observation? At, no, the adaptation is happening locally with low levels. But, but what caused the adaptation? Something global or something? No, local? the adaptation is happening locally low level. The perception is high level. Okay? Okay. Now this is just to say that there is one more thing, and that is that the eye can move and follow something. And if we follow something, how do we know that it's moving? The background is moving. The background is moving. Okay, so now we'll follow something without a background. And I'll explain why it's background. We can't see anything in the background. We just see some of this. We know that it's moving because we move a lot. There's an inferring signal from the motor cortex, which tells the eyes to move, tells also the visual system, you know that I'm about to move the eye, and then there's some action. Okay. okay, now what about complex motion? After all, if this moves, this line is seen to move this way, this line this way, and that line that way. How do we know how a complex object moves? And it's especially if Difficult because if we see a line behind an aperture, this line, if it moves this way, we will see it moving this way, which is the shorter distance. But you don't see the end. You don't see through this hole. You look through a peephole and you see a line moving. We will always see it moving the shorter distance. Okay. So therefore, when we see this, we should see this line as moving see some pole, which is the shortest component. So how can we see things keeping sturdy? Let's say we see a square. This part moves this way. This part moves this way, even though the square actually just moves to the right. So the real motion is the green one, but we should be seeing this moving that way and that moving that way. So one of the answers is we just take the average. 